Well, good morning. Welcome to Lawrenceville First. My name is Adam Hildebrandt, and I get to serve as the senior pastor here, and I uh, just love all of the amazing things that, that we got to celebrate earlier in the service, and uh, it was really a joy to be with our young people this weekend. Let me say thank you to all of you, uh, whether you're with us here this morning, whether you're uh, in person or online, the, the way that you live and give invests in the next generation. It invests in our young people, and that matters. That makes a huge difference. Uh, I can tell you as, as the uh, proud owner of two students and a, and a kid in our kids' ministry, you know, I got two in student ministry, one in kids' ministry, I am grateful for the way that this church invests in our young people. It's making a difference in their lives. It makes a difference in our family's life. And I know so many people who would say the same thing. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, we'll have some more video up on Facebook. We'll see some more pictures of uh, just what took place. It was a great opportunity to have uh, about 50 of our students, plus some college students, uh, plus some adults uh, in a safe way, uh, socially distant, wearing masks, uh, but just a, an opportunity for them to gather, uh, to share in time of community. You heard, uh, we even gave them Waffle House, okay? Like, y- y- you know, that's a spiritual experience. Like, uh, that, this, for us Southerners, those, the Waffle House is a spiritual experience. So it was a great weekend. Thank you for the way that you have invested uh, in that. Uh, we've been talking over the last few weeks about this idea of next. What's next? I mean, uh, we, this last week we began some new things in our nation, some uh, new season, a new time, a new president. It's, there's some sense of newness. And whether we think that's good, bad, or otherwise, doesn't matter, it's new. And so the question becomes, what's next? And I know some people say that with a lot of trepidation. They're like, oh gosh, what's next? And some people say that with a lot of excitement. I can't wait to see what's next. But no matter where you fall in that spectrum, as a church community, I hope we're asking that question with a lot of hope. God, what's next for us? What do you have for us individually and as a church? to invest in, to be a part of, to see God's hand at work. So that's where we've been over the last couple of weeks. We're going to spend this week and next week talking about that as well. Uh, But just wanted you to have that as the backdrop as we uh, begin our time together with a scripture reading that comes from Luke chapter 4. We'll read verses 14 through 21. If you're present with us today, I'll invite you to stand as you're able out of reverence for the gospel and hear these words today. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all of the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. But when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To let the oppressed go free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. As you're seated this morning, let me invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, as we open your word today, we pray that you would open our hearts, that we might sense what's next for us. God, that you might transform us in these moments, so we might be about the work of transformation in your world. God, let your spirit move in this place. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right before Christmas, my youngest son, Micah, uh, came to us and said, Dad, I need a video camera so I can start my own YouTube channel. 
Of course. Why wouldn't an eight-year-old need a YouTube channel? There's no reason I can think of. So I said, okay, what's this YouTube channel going to be about? He said, well, it's going to be about animals, and it's going to have some of my friends in it. So uh, if you happen to have an eight-year-old in your life who's a part of this church, they've probably been asked to be a part of Micah's YouTube channel. Now, we don't actually have a YouTube channel yet, but, but we're working towards that because he wants to talk about all of the different animals that he sees out where we live and, and you know all of the bugs and creepy crawlies and things that he picks up. And I'm like, I don't know if you should pick that up. And he does it anyway. It's okay. But I, I asked him, I said, Micah, why do you think you need your own YouTube channel? Why do you think this is a good idea? And he said, Dad, so I can be YouTube famous. (sighs) And I said, Micah, that's not the best reason. I said, why do you want to make these videos? Like, why does this matter? And he said, well, Dad, I want everybody to love animals as much as I love animals. There, that's it. I can get behind that. I can spend a little money on a video camera. I can take some of my time and invest it in in figuring out how to get an eight-year-old on YouTube. Uh, I'm sure that I've got somebody around here who can help me with that. Uh, But I I can do that. I can get behind. I, I like that. That's a good mission. That's a good idea. That's a good way to see the world. Let me help other people love animals as much as I love animals. It's almost his own little mission statement. I love mission statements. I'm like a connoisseur of, of businesses' mission statements. I, when anytime I have to use a business or, or I hear about a new business, I like to look up and see what their, what their mission statement is, what their vision statement is, what their values are, uh, because I just think it's so interesting to learn about all of these businesses and, and what they do and why they do it. And I love when, when people have personal mission statements, things that they really value. It tells you a lot about how they live their life and why They live their lives in the way that they do. Some of my favorites uh, come from, uh, you know, the the TED, the TED Talks. Their their idea, their mission statement is simply to spread ideas. That's a great mission. They do it so well. It's simple, it's repeatable, everybody gets it. Over at LinkedIn, which is, you know, very different, very kind of organized. It's to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. Okay, that says what they do and why they do it. It's it's meaningful, it matters, and it, it makes sense with what they're doing in the world. Over at Southwest Airlines, I love this one. It's to connect people to what's important in their lives through friendly, reliable, and low-cost air travel. That's good. It's not just about getting people from here to there. It's about the connections that we make. It's about the connections that matter. It's about getting people to their loved ones in a safe and affordable way. I like that. Over at Nike, their big thing is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete. And at the end, there's a little asterisk. And if you keep reading, they they define that little asterisk. It says, and everyone is an athlete. That's good. I see what they did there. That's smart. Inviting everyone to be a part of what they're doing. To bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete. I, I, I like Habitat for Humanities. Bring people together to build homes, communities, and hope. It says exactly what they do. It says why they exist. It gives people a big picture of the world and how they can be a part of it. You know, some people have these conversations about, you know, what's a vision statement and what's a mission statement. And some people will say that, that a vision statement is really a bigger picture of the world, and some people will say, no, 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 that's a mission statement, so wherever you land on that spectrum, that's fine, I, I, it doesn't bother me. Uh, but I, I kind of think about it in these terms, that a vision statement gives us the broadest scope of what it is 
that we do. And a mission statement really defines that a little bit more. It brings it down to something that we can get our hands around. It tells us what we're doing. Here at Lawrenceville First, I think that we have a vision statement. It's a big picture idea that we love God, love people, and reach the world. It covers all of the things that we do. It covers all of the ideas that we have. It covers all of the the, the ministries and missions that we're involved in. But as I think about what we're doing right now in this unusual time that we're living in, I want to invite us to think a little bit differently about maybe what our mission is right now for this coming year. And I want to do it in terms of what Jesus kind of defines in the Gospel of Luke as his mission, and what he's doing, what he's doing in the world, why he came, why he showed up. I think he reveals that in chapter 4. Chapter 4, he shows up back home in Nazareth. And he goes to the synagogue because he goes to the synagogue. It's what he does, right? Jesus shows up, he goes to the synagogue. They hand him the scroll, and he finds Isaiah chapter 61. And he begins to read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. There's a couple of words that get repeated in there. Let me see, Alex, do I have that slide? Nope, not that one. That one. Perfect. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus says that there's something unique in this moment about his presence there. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, which uh, if you read this in the Greek, release and free are the exact same word. They literally mean forgiveness. Forgiveness. Release, freedom, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus shows up and says, listen, I'm here to invite you to release, to forgiveness, to freedom, to transformation is really a good way to define it. If Jesus had a personal mission statement, this would be it. This is the moment. And he says, and guess what? Today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Greek literally means in your ears. Love it. Jesus shows up and says, because I'm here, because I'm present with you, the spirit of God is present with me and I'm present with you and therefore we're here to do this. This is what I'm about. Changing lives. Sharing good news with the poor. Release for the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and the oppressed going free. And if you read the rest of the Gospel of Luke, it sets up in this exact way. Jesus does these things throughout the Gospel of Luke. Joel Green, in his commentary on the theology of Luke, says this, Luke portrays both forgiveness and healing in social terms to match their more evident spiritual and physical overtones. What is forgiveness? What is release? But removing the barrier of sin that had previously excluded one from their own community. And what is healing, if not at least the removal of a barrier, sickness or uncleanness that has kept one from their own community? Release for Luke signifies wholeness, freedom from the social chains. It signifies acceptance. Green says that Jesus shows up and invites people to connect with him. And in that connection, transformation takes place. That something unique happens. Now, if we're thinking about what that might mean for us, I'd start with a 
A little quote from one of my favorite authors named Christopher Wright wrote a great book called The Mission of God's People. And he said this, it's it's not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world as that God has a church for his mission in the world. Mission was not made for the church, but the church was made for mission, for God's mission. The mission of transformation. See, this thing that Jesus says, this quote from Isaiah 61, this piece of scripture that Jesus chooses and relates back to his presence there in this moment. This is about the mission of transforming lives. Both our spiritual lives, but also physical lives. Jesus goes on to heal people who are blind, to, to set people free from, uh, from all sorts of different ailments. And it's because of the connection to his presence. So if we were to think about what it might look like for us in this strange world we're currently living in, where we can't gather in the way that we want to, where we can't have these huge events that we'd like to, where, 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 where Sunday mornings look a little bit different, what might it look like for us this year to really be about the work of transformation in our world? And here's what I think it looks like. If I was to say it, I would say it like this, that we need to be about the work of helping our community to experience transformation through a connection to Christ and the church. That our work as transformed people, as people who have experienced a connection to Christ, is to invite others to connect to Christ and to really focus that work in our community. Last week, we talked about this idea of me and Christ, and we drew some arrows When I'm at the center of my world, everything comes in towards me and my world gets smaller, it gets more complex, we have more anxiety, but but when we put Christ at the center, it's the kingdom and it's ever expanding and it's focused outward, it's focused on our community, our inviting our community to experience something that we have experienced. It's inviting people into a relationship, a connection to both Christ and the church that allows them to experience transformation. And as they experience transformation, we also experience transformation. That God is working on both ends of every relationship that we have to invite us into a deeper understanding of who he is. It's a way of thinking about Luke chapter 4, Jesus says, I'm present here. I'm providing a connection that leads to transformation. It's the work that we get to do as a church to invite our community to experience transformation through connection. Those two words, those two action words, transformation and connection, I think go together. Transformation always comes through connection to Christ and the church. Whether we're talking about a physical transformation or a spiritual transformation, whether we're talking about helping somebody to to be set free from addiction, or we're talking about helping somebody to be set free from a cycle of poverty. Those transformations still come out of connection. Those transformations still come from that reality of Christ present with us, working in and through us. Jesus says, I showed up to proclaim good news to the poor. My friend Alan Hoskin, who many of you probably know, he said something this last week. We were in a meeting talking about some of the things that we're working on over at Central Gwinnett, and he said something that just like blew my mind. I know if you know Alan, he's probably done this to you before. But he said this, he said, I've noticed that most often poverty is not a poverty of stuff, but it's a poverty of relationships. It's a poverty of relationships. That most often poverty isn't about having all the right stuff or having enough stuff. It's about having the right relationships to make sure 
that they can experience the transformation that takes place when they have those relationships, when they have people who are on their side, when we have the people who are advocating for them, loving them, walking alongside them, helping them to find the resources that are available. That transformation, in that case, comes through connection. Connection matters, and transformation matters. Those of us who have experienced transformation, those of us who have, have connected with Christ in a way that's changed our lives, it should flow out of us in such a way that we want to invite others to experience transformation. It's so fascinating to me because so often we find it really easy to talk about some of the things that we've experienced, some of the things that have have changed our life in some way. Most often, especially around this time of year, it comes in terms of like some sort of exercise routine or some sort of diet or uh, whatever that is that that has really helped us to find our, our, our footing in life. Uh, I see a lot of my friends post things about different sorts of of day planners that help them to organize their lives. Peloton people are my favorites. Peloton people are all in. I mean, you got to be all in for how much that little bicycle costs. I'm like, hey, look, I'll, I'll get you a Huffy and a, like a old TV to mount on top. I don't know. But people who love their Peloton and have experienced some sort of transformation through it love telling other people about their Peloton and the experience of transformation through it. Maybe we need to be a little quicker to talk about our connection to Christ and the church It's provided transformation for our lives so that everyone we run into, everyone in our community, everyone in our neighborhood knows that that God has done something in us and God is doing something through us, that we're a part of this bigger mission, helping people experience transformation. If you want to condense it down a little bit more, we've been saying this for a couple years now, but this is what this looks like when here at Lawrenceville First, we put Lawrenceville First. And some people are probably tired of hearing me talk about this. Some people are like, I don't know, you know, when are we going to talk about like building our church? And right now, it's, it's kind of a strange time to talk about that because we can't gather in the way we want to, because we can't do all of the things that that we're used to doing, because when we talk about building the church, sometimes we're talking about that me focus and not the Christ focus. But even more than that, I I grew up in Florida. I don't know if you know this. I've told you guys once or twice. I grew up in Florida, so I know a couple of things about the world. One of the things I know is that uh, jean shorts look great with every outfit. That sunscreen is overrated. That mosquitoes are everywhere. And that when the tide comes in, all of the boats go up. And so when we start talking about transforming our community versus building our church, we're talking about the same thing. Have you ever, I don't know if I've bumped into you at the grocery store, but like when I go to the grocery store, I look like Forrest Gump waving at Lieutenant Dan. Like I just wave at everybody because I assume that they're a part of our church whether they know it or not. And they may not know that they're a part of our church, but I know that they want to be a part of our church because we're transforming our community through connection to Christ and the church. So as we work to transform our community, as we join God in what God is doing, God pours out his spirit in a unique way. 
And as long as I don't get water in the boats, they all go up. Oh, captain, my captain. (laughs) So when we talk about the idea of Lawrenceville first, putting Lawrenceville first, we're talking about the experience of transformation in our community. We're talking about coming alongside people, building meaningful relationships that change their lives, and as they change their lives, they also inform our lives There's this mutuality of transformation. God shows up in both places. We learn as much about who God is from people we're walking along as they learn from us. And I, you know, it might make some of you uncomfortable when I say this, but the bottom line is I'm not nearly as concerned about building a church as I am about God using us to transform our community. Because I know that when God uses us to transform our community, we're not going to have any problem building our church. There are opportunities all around us to come alongside people. I don't know if you know this, but here in the city of Lawrenceville, we have the lowest per capita income of any city in Gwinnett County. And we have the opportunity to come alongside the Lawrenceville Response Center to volunteer for LEAP, Lawrenceville Employment Assistance Program, to to help people find the resources and living wage jobs that will allow them to flourish in life. But not just so they can have more stuff, but so they can have meaningful relationships that lead them to a relationship with Christ and the church. I think transformation means bridging the gap between the racial segmentation that takes place on Sunday mornings. It means that we walk alongside people. No matter where they're from, no matter the color of their skin, no matter what, we build relationships. And transformation transcends where we come from. Transformation in our community is can look as simple as writing notes of encouragement for our healthcare workers. You heard Jen talk about that invitation this morning. We're partnering with Universal Joint. I love, I love that there's a bar in town that's sharing all of our social media posts. How great is that? That's what partnership for the kingdom looks like. It's unexpected, it's unique. And yet God shows up and provides us with an opportunity to come alongside somebody who's doing great work for our community and join in transformation opportunities. Just the simple act of writing notes to go with those meals means the world. You heard me talk last week about our partnership with Central Gwinnett and how we're going to walk alongside some freshman families to make sure that those kids become sophomores because that's a big deal. That can be the difference between them dropping out and them graduating. Transformation might look like volunteering with LEAP, being a mentor, helping somebody to navigate the ins and outs of job hunting might mean partnering with the co-op or nothing but the truth or village of hope to deliver meals on Saturday. We're going to, in the coming weeks, we're going to talk with all of our ministry partners and we're going to do a little video open house, if you will, on Facebook 
that tells you a little bit about how you might partner with them, how you might be a part of the work of transformation that they're doing in our community so that we can provide connection to Christ and the church. So that we can engage with our community in a way that leads for, to transformation. The story doesn't end with Jesus rolling up the scroll and everybody applauding. If you keep reading in chapter 4, something interesting happens. Jesus tells them, this is, this is what I'm all about. This is what I showed up for. And, and then he lives the rest of Luke doing exactly that. But in Nazareth, his hometown, in Nazareth where he was from, Nazareth, a chapter after Jesus had been baptized and heard the voice of God saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus shows up in Nazareth and the people of Nazareth say, we really like what you're talking about, but here's what we want you to do. You're Joseph's son, right? Not the son of God. You're Joseph's kid. Hey, why don't you do some of those magic tricks you did in Capernaum? We heard about this, and we'd really like for you to do them here. And sometimes, sometimes it's difficult for us to wrestle with this idea that what we want Jesus to do is not always what Jesus wants to do. And Jesus begins to tell a couple of stories from Scripture about how God had worked through people who were outside of the Jewish community, how God had showed up in their lives to teach that community about God's presence with them, that sometimes transformation begins outside of the walls and works its way inside. And the people of Nazareth are like, whoa, that's not what we want. We want you to show up and do what we want you to do. We want you to heal some people like you did in Capernaum. Just do, just do what we ask you to do. Come on, you're from here. And they get so upset with Jesus that they pick him up and they carry him to the edge of town where there's a cliff. And in the New Testament, there's two ways of stoning people. You can either bring the rocks to them or you can bring them to the rocks. They took Jesus to the edge of town, intent on throwing him off the edge of the cliff. And in verse 30, it says this, but he passed by them and went on his way. That verse bothers me. Because I never want to be so committed to what I want Jesus to do that he passes by me on his way to do what Jesus wants to do in the world. I want to follow Jesus and do the work that he has invited us to do, the work of partnering with him for transformation in our world. It's the work that God has been doing, that God did through Christ, and that God is now doing through the church. Some people need to hear the good news. They need to experience transformation in their spirit. They need to be set free from hard hearts, from broken places, from sin, from baggage. Some people need a relationship, a connection to help them experience physical transformation in their world before they can even begin to hear about a spiritual transformation. May we as a church commit to doing what Jesus does by inviting people to experience what Jesus can do in their lives. 
Let's want what Jesus wanted. Because I don't want what I want Jesus to do to get in the way of what Jesus wants to do. In this world, in this community, and in this church. Let's help our community. That includes all of us experience transformation through connection to Christ and his church. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we want to know what you're doing through your son Jesus, through, his, through your spirit present with us. Because when we know your mission in the world, we'll know what to do next. God, transform us. Allow us to be transformed people who tell others about the transformation that can come through connection to Christ and the church. Allow us to be people committed to what you want in this world, not what we want to make you in this world. God, let us be a part of what you're doing in this community, in this city, in our neighborhoods, in this church, in our small groups, in the ministries that we're a part of, and the ministries that we're going to be a part of, in our student ministry, in our children's ministry, in our nursery, in our choir. God, let us experience transformation through your presence with us. God, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.